Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, I'm delighted we're speaking to Maura O'Sullivan, a mountain runner, adventure racer, and new mum. She's also the author of two fantastic books, Mud, Sweat, and Tears, and her most recent, Bump, Bike, and Baby, where she shares more about her journey of having a family while juggling training and doing adventure races. So I do just want to warn you, there are some pretty graphic conversations that we have about the impact that having a baby can have on your body and especially around bodily functions. So just be aware that there's going to be some uh, interesting conversation coming up. Hi, Maura. Hi, how are you doing? I am fabulous. Now, first of all, I love your accent. So if you can tell everybody, especially for our international listeners, where you're located, where you're based at the moment. um, I'm in Northern Ireland. I actually live in Ross Trevor at the foot of the Mourne Mountains. Oh, that sounds, it sounds absolutely idyllic and a perfect place to do all your running. Is is that where you grew up? No, I actually grew up in Derry on the other side of Northern Ireland. Uh, I don't know if you've seen on Channel 4 Derry Girls. Uh, actually, that was the school that I went to, which is portrayed in that comedy on Channel 4. I've never watched it, but you've made me want to go and watch it now to, <laughs> to see what the Derry girls are like. Yeah, they're a bit, uh, uh, get up to all sorts of tricks. L- lots of running, lots of exercise. That's what you mean, isn't it? No, more uh, <laughs> dodging bombs during the troubles. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was my, my childhood. Oh. So, so Maura, tell everybody just a little bit more uh, about you if they haven't heard about you. You know, how would you describe yourself? Uh, I would actually describe myself as a juggler. So I have loads of roles that I'm juggling at the moment. So um, I've, I am a full-time mom of two young boys who are two and four years old. And when I get a chance, uh, I'm also a mountain runner. And I do one day adventure races. And I also have just released a, a book. So I could say that I'm also an author. I love that. Sometimes there's so many different ways that you can you sort of describe yourself and the labels that you can put, put on. I mean, there's so many things that I do want to talk to you about, especially about being a mum to two young boys, doing the adventure races, doing the running and some of the challenges that you've, that you've done. But I'd be really interested to just go back to your childhood and growing up and, and just learning, you know, were you from a sporty family? Did you enjoy running? Uh, my, my parents met playing tennis, of all things, um, but I was never very good at, at, at that game. My father was quite adventurous. He uh, is a, uh, an avid sailor. And during when I was in my teenage years, he sailed ac- across the Atlantic and back uh, on the Arca race. So I come from a family that would be interested in the outdoors, and uh, but not necessarily running. That wasn't their thing. It was more during the time whenever I was at school that we were encouraged to athletics and netball. So just a general background of sportiness, but nothing involving mountains like I do now. So how did that transition happen? What was the journey to becoming a mountain runner? Was, was the running before the adventure racing? Exactly. I, whenever I was in my 20s, I was actually living in Kenya for a long time, uh, working with disabled children and uh, working with girls who have been sexually abused. And at the age of 30, I came home to Ireland. And just before I left, a good friend of mine who lived in Nairobi said to me, if you ever go back to Ireland, you should meet my brother, whose name is Paul Mahan, and he is really into just crazy outdoor adventures. And you might actually enjoy hanging out with him. So when I did uh, end up in Dublin later on that year, when I was uh, turned 30, I gave him a call and he said, listen, you're, the mountain running season has just kicked off. Do you want to go to a mountain race? And I had nothing to lose. I had never run out up a mountain, but I thought, hey, sure, why not? So he arranged to meet me in Dublin and brought me out to this boggy, wet, misty mountain in the middle of uh, the Dublin mountains. And the race was crazy and I hated it and loved it in equal measure. And when I got to the finish, I just thought, OK, I, I want to do this again, but I, re- I want to learn how to actually pro- mountain run properly. So that's how I got introduced to the whole sport. And I was very fortunate in that in Dublin, there's um, an organization called the Irish Mountain Running Association. It's based out of Dublin. And they have, during, particularly during the summer, they'll have two races on all around the country uh, every week. 
So I was able to get out loads and really started to enjoy the mountain running and also just really enjoyed hanging out with mountain runners. They're a great bunch of people. And I got, I've got like lifelong friends from that group. Oh, it sounds amazing. I was going to say, just for those people who maybe haven't been, spent time in the mountains or been running up mountains, you know, what was it about it that, that you loved? To be honest, I like the racing, but I more enjoy just being out there on my own running around. I love the solitude. I love the fact that you have the whole place to yourself, especially when you go off trail. I love the, what the mountains do, that, that they, they make you be humble, that they'll allow you to go out there if it's good weather and good terrain. But if they don't want you there, they'll very much tell you and they'll chase you off their, their, mount, their, their summits. So there's a lot of, I like who I am out there that I can just be me and that I can just be challenged in finding my way over the, the, the range and being able to, having the physical um, uh, challenge of, of being able to get around the mountains. So there's so many things about it that I really enjoy. As I said, you, you said as well that you, you had this opportunity um, through, the, through the mountain running club that you mentioned about learning how to do it properly. What, what do you mean by that? Is that in terms of like technique, like the technique of running uphill or downhill? Or is there just, um, do you have to learn navigation skills? What, how does that work? Yeah, exactly what you've just said. There's the physical aspect of being able to run uphill and downhill, having the right shoes, uh, making sure that when you run uphill that you're not, you're doing it at the right pace that you can manage it. Downhill meaning that you can just let yourself go and just run crazy, <laughs> run with your, your arms flapping and, and really just uh, not putting the brakes on. And then there is that other mental aspect of navigation, which you're, you know, I've been mountain running nearly for, for 12 years. And still I've, I learn about, about navigation every time I go out and uh, about being able to read the contours, read the, the, your bearings, knowing when to uh, stop and backtrack. And so all, all those aspects you, you're continually learning. So my my question would be is I, I haven't really done like any mountain running, but I've always remembered like coming down like sort of quite steep uh, mountains or hills. And when, you know, you have runners coming past you going full pelt. And my first thought is, oh, my gosh, it's fear. What if you trip? What if you fall? So do you find it scary running downhill at, at a fast speed, which I imagine that you are going? And how do you sort of could control that fear w- with the balance of going at such a fast pace? I think in the, in the back of my mind, I'm just going, wee! <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna, it has to be that, that little seven-year-old in you saying, wow, isn't this really fun? Uh, and it's just a head thing. Of course I have fallen. Uh, just last year, I was in a, an adventure race. And part one section is running up and down Crow Patrick Mountain. And that is an iconic mountain over in the west of Ireland, which uh, St. Patrick himself went up, our patron saint, he went up to the top of it and had to, and fasted and prayed in order to help himself convert the Irish to Christianity. So it's, it's a foreboding mountain. And I was running down, it's very steep, very, very rocky. And my toe just clipped a little tiny rock that was sitting in the middle of the track. And I went flying and I was caught up on my knee and my, and my, and my arms. And I, and I really didn't, I didn't know if I was injured. I just lay there. There was another racer who was coming up the mountain and she stood over me and said, are you okay? And I was like, don't touch me, don't touch me. Because I didn't know if I could continue on with the race. And it took me a couple of seconds to recompose myself and kind of do a scan of, of my body. And, and I was like, okay, bit of blood. It's okay. And I just got up, hobbled on and was able to get back to my bike and continue on with the race, thankfully. So, yeah, sometimes you do fall, but it's not the end of the world. And uh, it's all part of the of the fun of it. Absolutely. I love it. <laughs> so there's quite a there's an absolutely amazing challenge that, that you decide to do. Now, I hope I'm going to put out the Wicklow Round. That's correct. It's called the Wicklow Round. Tell everybody more about what the Wicklow Round is, how you first heard about it. So to to give a bit of background to your listeners, uh, there's a number of rounds that are, that are, are in the UK where there are challenges. The first one, I think, was called the Bob Graham Round, which was in the Lake District, where a man called Bob Graham ran around uh, a series of peaks in the Lake District, uh, which was around 100 kilometers. And 
uh, was, uh, I think it's around 7,000, uh, about 10,000 meters of climb. And he was able to do it within 24 hours and get back to Keswick within 24 hours. And since then, there's also now rounds in uh, Scotland, uh, out of Fort William, I think. Uh, that's called the Charlie Ramsey Round. And there's another one in Wales. And so there were three rounds in, in the UK on the mainland. And around 2007, a group of people out of IMRA, uh, the Irish Mountain Running Association, said, well, why don't we have a round also here in Ireland? So there's a set of mountains called the Wicklow Mountains, just south of, south of Dublin. And they worked out a 100-kilometer route with about 10,000 meters of climb, which they thought, uh, if you can get that done within 24 hours, that would be a, 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 a good challenge. And in the Wicklow, that goes or over 26 of the mountains. So the, I, I knew the guys who were, who were thinking, who were putting together this, this uh, challenge. So I went out with them on some of the recce's because nobody, you, can, you have to visit the actual summits of each of the mountains. But how you decide to go between the mountains is up to you. If you want to go straight and lose a lot of height or go through massive bog areas, you can. But if you want to kind of go contour around or take a, a longer route, but an easier route, that's also fine. So in uh, 20, 2007, I was doing all the recce's and I had a very good friend uh, called Andrew McCarthy. And you know, people were saying, this, this challenge, it's crazy. You can't do it. It's not possible. And he just sat down and methodically thought about how you could get round, how long it would take. And he said, we can do it. We can get round. And in 2008, we decided we were going to try. And then he got injured just before we actually went out and tried it. And in 2008, then I said, OK, well, look, I've done all the training. I've done all the homework. I know the route. Let me give it a go. So I went out and after uh, for the, for the for first five hours, it was through really, really thick mist. I got a bit lost. I was re I started to lose time. And then I, because I lost time, I didn't get off the mountains uh, when I wanted to. So I ended up on one mountain in the middle of the dark, which I wasn't meant to be on in, in the middle of the night. And I started hallucinating. So I had finished 24 of the mountains out of the 26. And I got back to my support team. And I was I was a wreck. I was I had started seeing zebras in the middle of the Wicklow Mountains. Zebras don't exist in the Wicklow Mountains. And I, I begged my support team not to make me go out and do those last two mountains. So I went home and I was, I, I cried for the whole day afterwards. Uh, cause I was just not because I had failed, but because I just given everything. And I was just exhausted. And after about a month, I started thinking again, Oh, what if I had just started at a different time and I went through a different area during the night? What if I just ate something different rather than what I ate that day? What if I wore different clothing or different shoes? And there was these all a list of little small things. I thought, if I just done that differently, then I could have got round because I did come so close. And so in 2009, I waited and waited. Uh, I said, I'll go the 1st of May. It rained for about 28 days after that. And you can't go out in the rain. It's just, it's too, it's too difficult a course to be going out in bad mountain conditions. You need good dry conditions for a day, which is actually to, for Ireland, that's a big ask. <laughs> so uh, it was around the 29th of May then in 2009 where I could see there was, just a, there was a gap. There was a 24 hours where it would, I, there was going to be no rain. And I went out and I be, was the first person to get around the course. And I did it just in 23 hours, 58 minutes, 22 hours, sorry, 58 minutes. Wow. I mean, there's, there's so much in there that I, that I want to come back to. I mean, thank you very much for explaining about the re the rounds. I mean, I, I have heard of like the, the Bob Graham round before, but I haven't yeah. heard about the ones, um, one up in, um, one up in Scotland and how awesome that you've been the first person to do it over in Ireland. I, th I think the interesting thing for me is coming back to that, that moment of defeat where not, I don't even want to use that word defeat, but you know, 24 mountains in just absolutely destroyed and broken, you know, you, you couldn't continue, you couldn't carry on, but coming home and, and dealing with that setback mentally, how did you get yourself from that almost that very negative place to that place where you started thinking, okay, well, hold on. What if I looked at things in a different way? Can you, were there any tips or tricks or what did you use to get there? Or was it a case of it just being time? Yeah, I think amnesia is a really <laughs> effective 
technique. Yeah, you your body will be screaming at you in pain. But once that subsides, you it's amazing how the good things you remember about the uh, about the run uh, come through. Like, you know, you see these amazing sunrises and sunsets during that time. You are running along the, this incredible ridge, which is just spectacular, and you feel the wind and you feel the air, and you just think, I am so lucky to be out there. And I think those good moments, thankfully, are what remain once the physical pain has gone. Uh, so, I, yeah, it is a question of time. And sometimes there have been things that I've done, like I, I ran in the World Adventure Racing Championships in Scotland in 2007, and I ended up, it's, it's for teams of four, and I ended up pulling our team out because I just couldn't go anymore. I, I hadn't slept for two nights, and I curled up. I remember curling up on, in some village in Scotland in the back of a post office. There was a charcoal bag, which I used as a pillow, and I just, just, just said, let me, just leave me here. Don't make me go back out there. And when I finished that, I said, no, I really am done with this sport. I really can't do this long, multi-day adventure racing um, in, in team environments. I'm just not cut out for it. And I think that that was fine. Uh, uh, but definitely with the round, I felt that, yeah, this is something I came so close and that I, and I want to finish it. I'm, a, I'm very much a starter finisher. If I say I'm going to do something, it'll take me a while to say, for me to say I'm going to do it. But if I say I'm going to do it, I'm going to try my best. And if I get round, brilliant. If not, that's fine. But at least I've tried. So in terms of your mental preparation, how do you prepare mentally for a challenge like this? You know, 24 hours, you know, less than 24 hours, you're out there all day, all night, intense condition, lots of elevation, you know, extreme running, navigation, etc. What are the what are the tips and tricks around that? Don't think about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, actually, you're asking because um, in the next couple of weeks, I'm hoping to do the Dennis Rankin round. Now, that is a, a very new round, which is just in the Moore Mountains, literally on my doorstep. And it was started about four years ago. Um, uh, and it is a, a round of all the Moore Mountain peaks. It's around, there's around 40 there. And so I am at the middle, in the middle of preparing for that mentally. And when I look at the map, and look at all the peaks I need to, to visit, my heart sinks. But when I break it down and I think, okay, so I will start at 3 a.m. and I will go up Steve Donard, which is the highest mountain in Northern Ireland. It'll be in the dark. I will go on the path and I will follow the wall. And when I get to that top, then the sun will rise and I will go towards Chimney Rock. And I think about it, I break everything down. So when I go up Chimney Rock, I will eat a sandwich. I will drink this. I will check the bearing. And then, so if I break it all down into what will I do as I go up each mountain, what's, what's going to happen during that is going to be, is it going to be light? It's going to be night. What will I see? What bearings will I need to do? If you break it down into the small bits, then it makes it much, much more manageable to thinking tomorrow I'm going to run hundred kilometers and scale the equivalent of Everest, which is a bit too much for your brain to, uh, compute really. Absolutely. I was going to say, so you've got this new challenge coming up. How do you train? Like, how do you, do you, do you work with a coach? Do you set your own training plan? Is it purely running or do you do gym based work? You know, what, what's like a schedule for you, like a weekly schedule? So I, I actually, when my firstborn was born, um, six weeks afterwards, I started working with a, a, a coach who was training me for adventure racing. And he, uh, so adventure racing being mountain running, road biking, and a little bit of kayak. So his, uh, his background is really around multi-sports. So I've been doing these adventure, these one day adventure races for the last three, four years. And it's only this year that I've got back to more mountain running, but I've stuck with him because I really like working with him. He's, uh, through being, having, uh, I only run maybe about two or two or three times a week. And the rest is either um, a day in the gym and on the road bike. And having that mix means that I'm very, very rarely injured. It's quite incredible how he's strengthened me up and he has given me things which wouldn't be just running. So that I, uh, like, for example, because I do a lot of road biking, I've improved a lot of my cadence and I've improved a lot of my power. And that has really helped me running uphill in particular, which I never would have thought could translate over. So typically I, and the great thing about having a coach is that he takes all the thinking out of training because I just don't have the brain space 
running after a two-year-old and four-year-old to be thinking about what am I going to do tomorrow? What should I run? Should I bike? What type of, of how long for? Where should I go? What type of effort should I do? So he takes all that thinking out uh, of um, out of my hands. And so typically I would, the, the kids go off to a play group in the, in the morning and that's when I would train. I would train anything between an hour and a half and two and a half hours uh, Monday to Friday. And then I have rest day on Saturday, we have family day, and then Sunday, maximum of three hours. And I try and also in the evenings for about 15 minutes, try and do some strength conditioning, some basics, just to keep everything um, pretty much injury free. No, I, th- I think it's fascinating. I mean, one of the topics that I do want to come on and talk to you is, is about training with with children and having a young baby so your most recent book is bump bike and baby and it's um, you know mummy's gone adventure racing and I just love to love to go back to to finding out about what it was like for you uh getting pregnant while I mean did you still train while you were pregnant and and how you sort of transitioned so uh ultimately I am the most unmaternal person probably on this planet. And in fact, the reason why uh, I have two children is thanks, thanks to, my, to my husband, who actually, when we got together, that he said, it, you know, I actually do want to have kids. And I really, you know, I love my husband very much, and I really think we're a great team. And that was kind of like, okay, if that's what you want, okay, I can, I can go along with that. But when it actually came to crunch time, when I was I was 36 and he was in his 40s, like he said, we know we you, we got to do it now. Then we we can't we're running out of time. So I didn't. Uh, I whenever I actually did get pregnant, I found out I, I I started thinking I was maybe pregnant during the middle of an adventure race actually, and uh, I the, my with my first time around being pregnant, I was in extreme denial. I was like I will continue on as normal. So. Within set, when I was seven weeks gone, I actually had a work trip to Ethiopia and I went to the GP and said, right, I'm off to Ethiopia and, I, and I'm pregnant. So what do I need to do? And she was basically looking at me saying, don't go. And I was like, but, but I have to, this is my work. I have to go. So she gave me uh, malarone to protect against malaria and up to my folic acid and gave me some basic advice. And so off I went. But whenever then I got there, I, I was convinced that even though I was feeling really sick, I thought, oh, that must be the spicy food that I'm eating. If there's no way, this could be morning sickness because I'm feeling this all day and it's not just in the morning. And then when I, I went for a run in Addis Ababa and I was really, really breathless and I was convinced it was the altitude. But uh, later I found out actually it's the progesterone in your body, which actually makes you much more breathless when you try and run. So there was, um, when I was pregnant with my firstborn, I really was in denial. I kept on going as much as I could when I was five months pregnant with him. I did a five-hour adventure race across one of the peninsulas in Ireland. And at the end of it, he gave me an almighty kick. And I realized that maybe uh, he's had enough of that. But I kept going. You know, I kept, um, I went orienteering up to eight months pregnant because I found that if I, if I went orienteering, uh, I would forget that I had a bump because I was so focused on the map. And so it was a great distraction. Uh, and, but then eventually I, the bump just got too big and I was walking and uh, swimming up to my due date. But then for my second baby, uh, I was running after Aaron, who was by now a toddler. So that was my, my workout. I was just far too exhausted to be doing anything uh, serious in terms of training or racing when I was pregnant the second time around. I managed to get a 5K in, did 25 minutes. When I was five months pregnant with my second one, uh, uh, Kaho. Um, but apart from that, there was, it wasn't, very, wasn't anything extreme. And I was really glad that I had, I had listed Aim, my coach, from uh, just after Aaron was born, because he was able to guide me through my pregnancy with Kaho. And he basically was able to very just look at what I was doing, look at uh, my sleep patterns, look at my heart rate, my resting heart rate. And he could say, okay, now we need to just tone it down. And he was the one who was saying, okay, well, maybe stop running. We just go stay on the bike at this stage. Um, maybe we need to stop biking. Maybe we need just to keep on swimming. And it was good to have that second opinion about what I should and shouldn't do um, for my second pregnancy. 
did you think or did you feel as though there was much judgment because I don't I don't know um if it's just just me or from like the images that I've seen there's always like this discussion around like women's bodies especially when they're pregnant like oh should she be lifting weights should she be running and isn't that dangerous for the for the baby did did you get any of that or did you notice any of that I I actually the um the first when I was pregnant the first time around with with Aaron uh in my state of denial I I was about coming to the end of my first trimester and I knew that mountain biking would be out because of the risk of abdominal trauma falling off um and so I bought a road bike and I joined a cycling club but I didn't tell them I was pregnant now that now when I think about it that's that's very silly but when they did eventually realize that I had a bump underneath my cycling jacket they were actually really, really supportive. And they were like, listen, why did you, you don't have to go at the front of the group. We'll protect you. We'll, if you st- cycle inside, if you decide which group you want to go with. And the people were really rallying around. And I think there has been quite a change in mindset about trying people trying to be very supportive of women who are pregnant, who are trying to keep active. Because it's not easy, of course. It's, you know, the days where you're so tired and there's days that you just feel like, you know, death warmed up. So I think that I do think it is changing more and more. Um, and so to be honest, even when I did the, fi- the, the adventure race when I was five months pregnant, people just generally actually just talked to me from my shoulders up and they kind of tried to, uh, there, there might've been glances <laughs> down at the, at the bump, but nobody said anything negative. And in fact, I was really lucky. I just got an awful lot of support of people around me. Oh, no, that's fantastic. And I'm so pleased to hear to, to hear about that. So having your, you know, being an athlete, doing your, your mountain races and adventure races, then suddenly you do have a child. <laughs> you've, got, <laughs> you've got a baby, baby Aaron, your first, your first born, your first, your first child. What was that like for you? Like, I mean, was there obviously must have been like this adjustment period. Were you able to get back to doing what you love quite quickly? Or was it just something that actually took longer than you thought it was going to? I, um, with, with Aaron, um, I had a urinary prolapse. So whenever I even went for a walk two weeks after childbirth, I literally felt like my insides were just going to fall out between my legs. So when I read that the incredible Irish Olympian Sonia Sullivan was back running two weeks after giving birth, I just thought, oh, my God, how did she manage that? So um, I was very fortunate in that when I was pregnant with Aaron, I met um, one of Ireland's top cyclists called Susie Mitchell. And she she's actually written an excellent book called Pregnancy to Podium. And I sat and talked with her and she said that she was able to keep training through her pregnancy. And that was actually another reason why I kept training through my pregnancies because she said, it's actually fine. You you should be fine. Just make sure you listen to your body. And whenever she, um, within a a couple of weeks of, um, she got back on her bike quite quickly after giving birth. And within four months of actually her uh, giving birth, she went and won a world master's track uh, cycling title. So I knew that you could get back, but, um, so I was really trying to look for signs that I could get back on the bike or whatever. So within two, within two weeks of giving birth, I tentatively sat on the saddle of my bike and actually found it didn't hurt too much. Um, and, uh, I, so I handed Aaron over to my husband and said, can I just go for a little bike ride? And so I went out for an hour very slowly and it was just amazing I just I love bike riding anyway but my goodness I all of a sudden I could cycle fast and I didn't have to worry about falling off and damaging the bump and I I had my lungs back my lungs were no longer scorched into tiny little area uh they were fully (laughs) expandable now that the baby had come out and I just came back and I was buzzing with um, adrenaline and endorphins. And I just realized this is really important for me to keep this going because I just, motherhood is actually, I, I think it's great, but God, it's hard. It, it's really, really hard, especially when you're used to being, you know, having your own time and, and being able to do what you want when you want. The, I, people told us before having children Babies take 24-7 care. Someone must be with them all the time. And I don't think you ever fathom how 
realize how, how, how that's going to affect your lives. And so it does, uh, it was okay for the first couple of weeks after Aaron was born, Pete was there. So if I wanted to go out for a run or, or a bike, I was able to hand him over. But then as the month progressed, yeah, he had to go back to work. I was sitting there holding the baby. You couldn't, you can't use a running buggy until they have enough head control. And that's for a couple of, of months. And so you can't, you can't easily, very easily get trapped. And so that is, that was uh, something which I was really uh, apprehensive about. And fortunately, um, Pete, before he went back to work, we, we found some, we found this great little crash that could take Aaron just for even for an hour so that I could just hand him over to somebody who would look after him and I could go for a run or a bike or do go to the gym and then come back. And I was infinitely more happy to see him. So it is juggling, but actually it, it was definitely a formula that, that was, was, which worked for me. Oh, I, I, well, I, th- I think it's so important that we do actually talk talk about this and you know how having um, a baby can change your life and what an impact it is gonna is gonna have and there's no sort of denying it and there's obviously lots of juggling that you have to do um when did you with with your book bump baby uh, bump a bike and baby when did you start training for your next adventure race was it after your second child or was it in between I um so when Aaron was born. Then I got my GP uh, six week checkup, which allowed me to she gave me the all clear. And as soon as that came, I started working with Eamon, um, my coach. And we, I uh, because Susie had after four months won the world title. I thought I'd like something, even a little piece of that. So I actually entered a uh, adventure race over in Westport. Uh, in, this, in the west of Ireland, when our Aaron was four months old, and it, I didn't care how well I did or how badly or anything. I just said I got to have some sort of goal to get me back out there, and I think that really helped to have that goal because it just kept me. Even though when I went running, it was literally a case of walk a minute, run a minute, which is, is it sounds horrible, but that's all you're, I was able to do at the beginning. And very, but very quickly, I was able to get back up to running, um, without, without walking. And, um, so I went to the adventure race and, uh, I actually came third, which was kind of a bit crazy. So there's a photograph of me, uh, at the prize giving with Aaron in this wrap beside me because he'd fallen asleep because the prize giving was like, it's 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> and, uh, so he, so, um, I, you know, I think it was, it was great to be up to, to get to to get going again. I remember I got very ill afterwards then because it was just so, so much of a stress on the body and I got a really bad cold. Um, but then that set me, it set me up then to do, to go into proper winter training. I did a lot of strength, an awful lot of strength conditioning, uh, to try and get my core back into shape. Um, and I then did, uh, so Aaron was born in 2013. So 2014, I, uh, I entered the Irish National Adventure Racing Series, which is a series. Uh, there's nine races all over the country, and you had to do four to um, it was a, the, the results from the best four races counted to your overall total. And I managed to win that series um, when Aaron had just turned one. Oh my God, that is honestly beyond fantastic! <laughs> um, massive congratulations. Tell us a little bit about some of the races. What was the most sort of challenging aspects for you? It was. Uh, Gale Force West, when I traveled down to the event, and it's, there's an awful lot of, of administration to be done before these adventure races. So you got to register with your number the day before and drop your bike and get checked into your, uh, to your hotel because the Gale Force West starts at 6 a.m. Um, in the middle of Connemara. And uh, I was so much rushing around uh, that I, I was still breastfeeding Aaron. I, fed, I breastfed both my babies up to 14 months. And I, um, I was in the hotel and I got the most horrendous bout of mastitis. I just, uh, which is a blocked milk duct. Um, and basically I hadn't had the time to feed him. So the milk was building up, building up. And I just hadn't, didn't think about, uh, the consequences. So I was day before the race lying in bed, had the shakes. I had flu like symptoms. I couldn't get the milk out. It was my, my poor boob was, it was as hard as a rock. Aaron was too busy exploring the bathroom and flushing toilets and sticking toilet roll down the toilet and everything to want to feed. And it took me a while before I could get the milk out. And I, I, I had, and when I eventually got the milk out, Aaron decided to, when he, Aaron decided to feed, I still had all the symptoms. The damage was done, 
but we traveled so far to go to the race that I still lined up and uh, I felt really pretty dire during the race. But the funny thing is you just don't know when you, when you turn up at a race, what other people are going through, whether they're injured, whether they've got other um, issues going on with their own bodies. So I eventually, I actually went, just took, took the race at my own pace because I knew how fragile I was. I actually ended up winning it. So I think the, the, the moral of the story is just line up. You never know how you get on. And, uh, yeah, if you're breastfeeding, make sure you feed the kid before you do your race. I was just having this image. I, I know nothing about this stuff because I just don't have a children. It's like, I was thinking like a, not breast exploding, but you know, like just milk, just like. Oh, but you, you want it to explode. It's <laughs> so sore. Oh my God. Yeah. And, and like literally once you, once it starts flowing, then it does kind of explode and you're glad to get rid of that milk. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's something which is, uh, nobody ever told me that, you know, there's a, people say about recovering after childbirth, your body will, you think, oh yeah, maybe my, my core won't be so good. Or maybe uh, my insides will take a bit of jigging around, but you know, there's, I didn't realize that you could ha- get so, uh, so have some, so many issues around breastfeeding. The other thing which happened during a race as well is because remember I said that I had a, um, uh, a urinary prolapse with Aaron. So what that means was that you go for a run and you just wet yourself. Um, and you just have no control. And actually, I was in the middle of Dingle Adventure Race, and I had I had done a, uh, a, like an hour bike ride up and over the Connor Pass. We had run up and over Brandon Mountain for about it took an hour and twenty, and then there was a ten k road run back into Dingle before you could do a, a kayak in the harbour. And the ten k road run, I was pounding away, pounding away, and I stopped at the kayak section to get into the kayak. And that stopping after all that jarring all of a sudden my bladder just went and I just, I could feel the, the urine just gushing down the inside of my leg. And I was like, Oh my God. Oh no, no. And they were all, the people who were standing around in the kayak section said, are you okay? Have you got cramp? And I was like, no, I can't just tell you I've just wet myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like, no, it's absolutely fine. And I, all I could think was, God, I hope the person who comes in this kayak after me doesn't sit in my puddle of pee. <laughs> so, you know, and, and you just, the thing is, you could that that could make people stop. I know there are women who, after childbirth, just don't run because because stress and confidence it is embarrassing. But I kind of got to the stage where it's like, you know, I so love running and I so love racing that if I wet myself during during a race, so be it. Because you're not going to take the running away from me. Can I say thank you for being so honest and sharing this? Because there will be so many other, you know, women out there listening. I was just like, you know, how do you cope with cope with that? Like, or how does it get better? Or can you improve it? Or is it just something that's just going to be there initially when you go back to running? That's a really good question. Because I was talking to Dr. Juliet McGratton about this, and she's she's very much into women getting back into uh, getting them active, and she said that you know, it's really important that to realize it can get better. So it took me a year after each of the births for I was doing lots of strength and conditioning, my pelvic floor exercises, lots of squats, lots of lunges. And actually it did um, strengthen everything up. And so now I don't get stress and confidence anymore. So it's, I think that there's a lot of women who think they have to live with it. But there are ways that it's kind of boring and it's repetitive, but there are ways to actually strengthen everything up so that you, you don't suffer from it anymore. Yeah. Oh, no. Th- thank you for sharing that. I mean, now you've got two kids and I'm, I'm sorry, I've forgotten, forgotten their ages. How old, are, how old is Aaron? And two. Uh, so Aaron is four and Cahill is two. So you've got, four, you've got a four and a two year old. You're still doing your training. How is that working out for you now? Have you managed to sort of incorporate them into your fitness routines? Is it very much a case of, you know, utilizing babysitters and crashes and, you know, and your husband, etc.? How does that work for you? I think it depends on what stage they're at. So whenever Aaron was newborn up to the age of one, I would, uh, it was quite easy to put him in the running buggy whenever after about a couple of months. And so just to go for a run in the buggy. And it was, it was brilliant because uh, he, it was, he would often fall asleep in the buggy and he would get a bit of fresh air. So, but when I had two, there's just not anywhere where I live where you can have a double buggy. It's just, we don't have the, the infrastructure um, paths around here. Uh, equally, whenever um, my bike, uh, whenever my, I gave birth, my 
husband asked me if I wanted a, a birthing present. So he said, do you want a diamond ring or something? I was like, no, 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 no. I want bike rollers. I want to be able. <laughs> and he's like, what? Where did I get them? I was, like, I was like, don't worry. I'll buy it. I'll send you the bill. <laughs> and it was great. They're the best things ever because even now with the kids, if, if I don't have anyone to look after the kids, um, I'll let them watch TV. And I'll put the bike rollers down and I'll do my session for an hour. And so I can actually stay inside and look after them. Or, is, you know, if there really is, there's nobody to look after them, then I'll just do some strength conditioning and they normally jump all over me and that's fine. So um, when they're younger, it is much easier to get to train with them. But as they get older, they're, you know, two and four, I can't push them around. Um, so basically, yeah, it is about managing. They go to the, um, Aaron now goes to playgroup and Carl goes to a child manager who lives right beside the playgroup. And so not only do I get my time, but also I'm really glad I've done that with, with them up from a young age because now that I didn't want them to be clingy to me. Yes, I am a stay at home mom, but I want them to realize that sometimes it's important that they aren't with me. And so, um, it's, it's been a good strategy for both of us. Well, fantastic. And I love that push present. That is the best story I've heard. Like, <laughs> no, don't want a diamond ring. I want bike rollers. It's like, what? Oh, that's great. <laughs> and they're great for, great for the core as well. And my balance is much better. And, uh, yeah, definitely a great birthing present. So what's the next, uh, what are you training for next? So actually tomorrow I'm off to Quest Wales and which is a uh, adventure race uh, around Betsy Code and which is going to be it's a, like run bike run bikes kayak run bike run and um around that area in Snowdonia um I the uh, Dennis Rankin round now I'm just looking for a weather gap in May June to doing that uh then I'm hoping to do a 250 kilometer race adventure race down in Clarny which is in the south area of Ireland, um, around some of the, like uh, some of the most beautiful parts of Irish wilderness. There's, it includes a, um, a climb up Karen Tool, which is Ireland's highest mountain and some incredible cycling around the Malls Gap and the, the Black Valley around there and all, along the peninsulas. And then, uh, in the middle of September, it's, I hope to do my favorite race, which is the Mourne Mountain Marathon. I don't know if you've ever heard of like the Alm, the original mountain marathon over in the UK or the lamb is basically the format is it's a two day race and you're in teams of two and you have to carry all your supplies for 36 hours. So your food, your tent, your sleeping bags, your, uh, uh cooker, um, and you've got all your clothes, your map compass. And as you start the, the race, you have, uh, you're given just a list of coordinates, you plot them on your map, and then you have to visit the coordinates in as fast a time as possible. Um, on the first day and then the second day again you start out and you um get another set of coordinates and you have to run around so um i just love that format i love the the teamwork that's involved i love the fact that you have all this root choice so you have to make a lot of decisions on the run and i have a great um uh, team mate who is actually paul mahon who introduced me to mountain running over a decade ago and uh because we know each other so well um we actually make a really good team so uh that's on in September. Oh, it sounds fantastic! All of these different challenges you've got coming up. Could you just quickly explain about the the Dennis the Dennis? Did you say Rankin round? Yes. Tell me, tell us a little bit more about that. So that is, um, it's around forty peaks. I can't. I think it's forty in the Moor Mountains. So uh, ideally, I'll start at three a.m. from the Newcastle, which is a coastal town right beside Northern Ireland's highest mountain, Slieve Donard. And so it's, um, I've got 24 hours to go around these 40 peaks. Um, and, uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that's, that's the challenge. Fantastic. Why do you start at 3 a.m.? Um, you basically look at the route and see where do you want to be during the dark, during the nighttime, because nighttime navigation is quite challenging. And also, um, it can be quite, yeah, it, 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 you want to be in a place that's, that could be at least navigated at night. So at 3 a.m., the, there's going to be sunrise around 4.30. And if you start from Newcastle, there's a path all the way up Slave Donard um, and you can follow the walls. So and when it gets daylight, then you start on open mountains so that there's no paths and no walls to follow. And then hopefully, if I start at that time, I'll be coming off the last mountain, which is Slave Comeda, just before it gets dark. And Slave Comeda, again, it's open mountains, so, you, so you, you'd prefer to get off there before it actually gets dark. Awesome. Now I'm going to ask um, 
what I think is like quite a personal question, but it's something which has just come up in like in the Tough Girl Tribe, the closed community that I have, which is talking about, oh, I don't know how to say it in a non-graphic way, but like um, basically having the shits when you're running. Um, <laughs> and so I'm just wondering, because you've been so open and honest about, um, about peeing, does that happen to you? And, or, you know, have you got any tips or tricks about it? I mean, is it based on, on nutrition or does it not happen to you? Well, actually, one of the things is whenever with Aaron, the first one of the first times I actually ran after having Aaron, I did poo myself immediately because I just had no bowel control at all after giving birth. So uh, that's the that area has fortunately strengthened up in terms of uh, like I normally have a bit of a dodgy tummy before the races, I think, because I've been racing for so long. My body now knows when it gets when I get nervous before a race, then that's the time to evacuate everything. So um, I think slowly my body has learned that. However, in the Wicklow round, um, which I did uh, 10 years ago, I do remember very graphically that uh, when you're doing these rounds, you actually, it becomes a bit of an eating contest. So you just, you're trying to constantly fuel and you're stuffing and things which you can carry. So you really do end up eating a lot of crap. So you're eating sandwiches and brownies and gels and energy bars and, and mixing in electrolytes. And so I just remember I, I was about 20 hours into the run and I just really had to go. And it just was a slurry that came out of me. It was disgusting. Um, but generally what I feel is that, especially in the mountains, I think maybe it's different from road running, but in the mountains, you're covered in so much bog and shite and sweat and blood from getting cut on the, bo- on the heather and on the gorse that one more bodily fluid really doesn't make much of a difference <laughs> just go with the flow in a way <laughs> now i don't think you can really say that on on a road but basically you know don't worry about it i think people do like for example again this might be a bit too much information but i remember somebody asking me about periods on a round what happens if you get your period and I just basically said, if you get it, you get you get it. You know, it's just a bit more blood and deal with it. Nobody's going to be out there to see you changing any pads or anything. Or um, and if there's a you know wear wear black tra- black leggings and so you won't see any any marks. Um, yeah, I suppose you just get on with it because if you don't, then you just kind of stay at home and you you're afraid to do do what you love. Absolutely. Just get on with it. So, Maura, you've written um, two books. One is uh, Mud, Sweat and Tears, and the other is The Bump, Bike and Baby. Do you just want to give a little bit of info about both books um, so that people and where people can go and obviously go and buy them? So, Mud, Sweat and Tears, I wrote straight after finishing the Wicklow round. Uh, I actually had lost my job just before doing the Wicklow round. Uh, it was just the t- time of recession, 2009. Irish economy crashed. So straight after the Wicklow round, I actually moved to Vietnam with my now husband, Pete, and he was working in Hanoi. So I basically sat in an apartment and just wrote the book. And it was an outpouring of just, I loved mountain running so much. And the Wicklow round had taught me so much, not about mountains, just about mountains, but also about myself, about, you know, I didn't realize that if I just dug deep, um, what what would actually come out, that I did have a lot of resilience and that um, I was stronger than I thought. And I just wanted to, to put that down so that women would would read the book and say, actually, um, you know, there's something I've always wanted to do, but I thought I'd just never be able to do it. I did the Wicklow round. I didn't know if I could do it, but I would only know if I gave it a try. And I wrote it, that book so that people would just go out and try stuff. It doesn't matter if you fail um, or even succeed, just go out and try. So I wrote that in 2009. And then I was looking for a publisher uh, and it, it's such a niche book that I, I didn't get anything. So I self-published in 2011 and uh, that's available on Amazon in paperback and in, uh, in, on, on, as an ebook. Then fast forward with the kids. So I wrote Bump, Bike and Baby when I was emerging from my sleep deprived haze, which had lasted around four years. And finally, at 18 months old, Cahal, my second born, was starting to sleep through the night. So I actually had enough brain power to actually think, yeah, I'd like to write down just what happened because, you know, this is the, I want to write the book that I would have liked to have read before getting pregnant to realize, yes, it is great. Motherhood's great. And don't be worried about it. It will be fine. You can still keep on, uh, 
you, with your athletic endeavors whenever you've had kids. But my goodness, it's difficult. And there are things like the like it really is a warts all account. Uh, account. It does talk about mastitis. It talks about stress and constants. It talks about also the relationship between myself and Pete. And yeah, we were really happy to have kids, but it did put a, a, a real strain on us when we had to redefine who we were. And we'd have arguments over stupid things because we were so tired and still and trying to work out how to to look for after what was a lovely baby, but sometimes a very grumpy baby. And so, you know, it's very much um, hopefully will be helpful to people who are before they get um, pregnant, people who are wondering how they can get back to training, um, how much they can do whenever they're pregnant, how much can they do afterwards and just preparing people uh, for, you know, uh, having kids. So I, um, I wrote that, I, I wrote two chapters, sent it off to a publisher uh, in Scotland and uh, they, they loved the idea. So they said, can you, can you finish it up? Um, and I did, I actually, they, I had around three months to do it. So basically what happened was that um, Cahal would have his afternoon sleep. And as soon as he went to sleep, I put on Paw Patrol for Aaron and I would write a thousand words. And a book is 80,000 words. So you do that for three months, you've got your book. So I did that. And so it just got released there on the 15th of March, 2018. And it's available in bookstores and online, um, wherever, wherever you source books. Well, absolutely fantastic. And Maura, you've also got, you're also online. Where's the best place for people to find out more about you on, in the social world? Uh, I've got my Twitter account, which is Maura O'Sullivan, M-O-I-R-E-O-S-U-L-L-I-V-A-N. And I also have a blog, which I normally just blog about the, the races I've been doing. And that's also MauraOsullivan.com fantastic and i'll make sure to put all of the links down below in the show notes more thank you so much for coming on tough girl podcast and being so open and honest about having children about the impact it's had on your body and and just being so real for other women out there listening because i know it's this these conversations are so important to have um and it's been fantastic to to get you know your point of view and, and to hear more about your journey and getting back into the mountain running and the adventure racing that you've been doing so thank you so much no problem it's been great crack all together lovely talking to you Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed that very open and honest discussion that we had, especially around bodily functions. I'm so pleased that Maura could be so open and honest about you know her experience of having a child and the impact that it has had on her training. Now, one of the first things I really want to reiterate and to make sure everybody does is this is not a comparison because I know that I, I do this as well and I know it's difficult not to, but sometimes you can hear other people's stories and immediately start thinking, I'm not like that. I couldn't continue training while I was pregnant. I wasn't able to get back on my bike after two weeks of giving birth. I wasn't winning races four months after after my birth. So the key thing here is this is never about comparison. So please don't compare yourself to anybody else, anybody's pregnancy journey. Everybody is an individual and everybody's going to have a different situation. So this isn't about comparison. This is about just listening and taking on board the facts that you can use or the bits of tips and the bits of information that you can apply to your life. But please don't compare yourself. Please don't feel bad about yourself just because you're not at that stage at the moment. Every pregnancy is different. Everybody gets back to training at their own pace and it's very, very personal. So um, with that being said, I now just want to give you some recommendations of podcast episodes to listen to of when I have spoken to women who've got children or who are trying to have children and how that's impacted on their life. So I'll just give you a brief rundown of um, six Tough Girl podcast episodes, which I think would make fantastic further listening. Most recently, we spoke with Hannah Engelkamp, who walked 1,000 miles around Wales with a donkey. Now, Hannah didn't have a child at that point when she did that challenge, but she did have her first son after that. And what's interesting is how Hannah shares the impact that it had on her life in terms of adventure and doing challenges and having to go through this transition period. And again, Hannah was very open about her personal struggles with that. We've also spoken with Beth French. She's this incredible ultra marathon swimmer. She is a single mum. She's got an autistic son and she does an incredible job. Again, very, very practical, very down to earth and just tells you more about her situation and how she manages it. We've also had conversations with women. So we spoke with Tina Muir 
Muir, who is a GB marathon runner who was you know desperate to start a family, but she hadn't had a period for nine years and she never she didn't know if it was going to be a possibility or not. So she very openly, honestly, t- talks about about her struggles of wanting to have a child, but the impact of not having a period. So well worth listening to as well. I mean, there is there's a very happy ending with Tina's story that, you know, last year or this year, I think she did actually have her child. So that is, you know, such fantastic news for Tina. The Yorkshire Rose. This was a team of four mums from Yorkshire who ended up going to row across the Atlantic Ocean. So all these all these women were in their late 40s, early 50s. They've got older children, but they do have jobs. They do have careers. They do have a family. And they share more about how they how they balanced it, what systems they put in place to enable them to go and do this challenge. Selena McColl, she's a mother of two who ran the MDS. She's also had, you know, she's got a big job, a family as well. Again, how she balanced it, how how she fitted her training around. She she was she did phenomenal training for MDS and ended up becoming the first British woman back. Again, a very inspiring story. Um, one of my favourite stories as well is Larry Morgan, who is um, who's from Wales. She's an ultra endurance runner, and Larry is just one of the most dance worth people you could ever imagine chatting to. She had a baby when she just had a baby when we when we first caught up with her, and she talks more about you know training, getting back into running. And what was lovely is actually on the podcast we can hear we can hear the baby waking up from its little snooze, having its little nap. But this is this is the the new life that she's got now. She does have a baby. She does have to take that on board when she does training and trying to fit everything in. So ladies, no comparisons allowed whatsoever. Push that out of your head. You're doing a fantastic job, whatever stage you're at, whether you have children or don't have children, it's all absolutely amazing. If you do want more information about any of the women that I've spoken about and you're new to the podcast, then please do go check out toughgirlchallenges.com because you can find so much information on there. There's about 160 episodes of the podcast. We're going back to 2015. They, the area on average from around 45 minutes to about an hour, sometimes an hour 15. Um, I equally, there's more information about me, some of my different challenges, running the Marathon de Saabs, through hiking the Appalachian Trail in 100 days. There are links to the books that I have written. I've got three books, Shally Hosting, Marathon de Saabs, and Climbing Kilimanjaro. They're all Kindle books, self-published books. It's one of the ways that I fund myself and help to support me by giving myself a salary. The other way that I do this is through patrons. So I have around 195 patrons out throughout the world, men and women who are supporting the podcast, who love the content, who want to make sure that they are giving back to help me continue to put out this free content because this is this is what I love to do. I'm so passionate about it. It's amazing to be able to share these stories. If you've been inspired and motivated and it's really and it, you know it's added value to your life and hand on heart and you think actually, do you know what? I listen to the Tough Girl podcast every Tuesday or I listen to it on my runs or my walks or when I'm pottering. And actually, after I listen to an episode, I feel really inspired. Then please help to give somebody else that opportunity. Um, Because, you know, the more funds that I have coming in, the more that I can, more that I can do, the more that I can outsource and the more value that I can add back to you. So it's almost like the self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, But super keen to help you out. If you do want to become a patron, then please do go check out Patreon. P A T R E O N dot com forward slash tough girl podcast. And if you become a patron, your name will get listed on a dedicated patrons page on my website so you know that you are a supporter of the Tough Girl podcast. And in a couple of years, when we look back and we hit, you know, a million downloads or we hit the 200th episode or a 300th episode, you'll know that you've been a part of this journey and you've helped me to get to that point to motivate and inspire women and girls and to increase the amount of female role models in the media. New episodes are out every Tuesday, 7 a.m. UK time. Hit that subscribe button, tell a friend, but have an awesome day wherever you are, whatever you are doing. Just get out there, have some fun, smash it. Believe in yourself because I believe in you. You can do whatever you put your mind to. All right, take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye. Bye.